you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Luke chapter 1. And over these four weeks of Advent, we're talking about the Magnificat, Mary's song, where she magnifies the Lord. And as we're walking through these words of Mary, as she is exclaiming the wonder of the Lord our God, that we are learning some things about who God is uh, Mary is teaching us, this is sort of a, uh, it's a sort of a lesson in song for us about the nature of God. The best of our singing teaches us things about God. It reminds us of those truths that are of utmost importance. And, and when we lift our voices, we sing not only to the Lord, but to one another as we write those truths upon our hearts. And so Mary in her singing is writing this word upon our hearts, this word about who God is. And she started in her opening salvo with words about the fact that our God is magnificent. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. We'll see in days to come, Mary exclaiming the fact that our God, her God, my God, your God is mighty and he's mindful. But today I want you to see in Luke chapter 1 and verse 50 that my God is merciful. And that's a place where we want to rest for a moment today. Because the reality is that there's none of us who are not in need of the mercy of Almighty God. It is God's mercy that that takes us who are sinful people responsible for rebelling against Holy God, deserving of condemnation and judgment and wrath, and He takes us off the hook. He frees us from the condemnation that we deserve. He pours out mercy upon us and lets us go free. And not because the sin didn't matter. And not because the judgment and the wrath are not to be poured out. But because instead in the wonder of his blessed and beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ, God has poured all of his wrath out upon Christ and freed all those who put their faith in him. I want you to hear Mary declare today, my God is merciful. And if you're here this morning and you've never experienced the mercy of God, why not throw yourself at his mercy today? Why why not bow your heart before a holy God and say, listen, I'm a sinner in need of a savior and you're a god who's willing to save would you have mercy on me a sinner my friend i believe that'd be the beginning of life for you so if you're able and willing to stand would you please stand in honor of the public reading of god's word from luke chapter 1 verse 50 and this is what the word of the lord says And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Father, I'm thankful that we gather in this place dependent upon your mercy in the same way that our fathers and grandfathers were dependent upon your mercy and in the same way that our sons and grandsons will be dependent upon your mercy. Because the mercy of God that saves, rescues, delivers, and forgives is for all those who fear him from generation to generation. So Lord, if we're here today and we've never received that mercy for ourselves, then may this be the day when we fear the Lord and begin walking in obedience to Him 
and find, God, that you are sure and steadfast in your mercy toward those you love. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Of course, you know the context of this, but let's just be reminded for a moment that Mary is singing in response to an encounter that she has had with an angelic messenger. And that angelic messenger has borne to her a word of overwhelming news, not just for Mary, but for the world. That word that the angel Gabriel brings to Mary is a word of, of promise, a word of hope, a word of deliverance, a word of salvation. It is a word that upends Mary's life and indeed upends the whole world because contained in that message is the promise that the Holy Spirit will overshadow Mary and cause her to give birth to a son and that that son will be the savior of his people. He, he will be the one who is Emmanuel, God with us. In the wonder of that moment, Mary is overcome, overcome by the change in her circumstance, overcome by the concern of what others might think, but mainly overcome at the wonder that the holy God of heaven and earth should favor her life in such a profound way. I wonder where do we stand in our lives in 2021 here at Christmas time on the second Sunday of Advent? Are we overwhelmed and overcome at the wonder that God should love us? At the wonder that God would pour out His grace and His mercy upon us? At the wonder that God would favor us? Or have we come to expect it? Have we come to expect the favor of God in our lives? Have we come to count it as just a part of doing business, just a part of the transaction? This is just what comes when you walk with the Lord, when you, when you have a, a, a fairly good life, when you sort of do the things that God expects. We know the favor and the wonder. I'm just here to tell you today that Mary, when she experienced the favor of God poured out upon her life, was overcome in such a way that God of heaven and earth would love her, honor her, grace her, favor her, that the only way she could respond was from the depths of her soul to cry out in adoration to the Lord. It ought to mark you. It ought to mark me. I mean, when we, rem when we remember, when we realize, when we see the wonder of God's grace toward us in Christ, I mean, it all just come bubbling up out of us. Other things do. Other loves, other passions, other zeals come bubbling up out of us. If you don't believe that and you hadn't been paying much attention on Saturday afternoons in the fall, when we've got that 5.1 surround sound beefed up and roaring through the house and Daddy's in his chair, his lazy boy recliner propped in front of the television to watch Auburn or Alabama, and he's run everybody else in the house to their own portable devices because if they say one wrong word, it will mean a family rift before Thanksgiving or Christmas. And we watch that ball game, and we turn on that radio commentary because we can't stand to listen to the commentary on the television. Am I striking a note with anyone this morning? And what happens? All of a sudden, on the field of play, our team is losing or our team is winning, and it just comes bubbling up. And if you have a daddy like I had a daddy, then you've probably heard these words before. They can hear me in Tuscaloosa, boy! Other loves come bubbling up, don't they? But where's our love for Christ? Where's our affection for the Lord God of heaven and earth? Where's the joy, the peace, the hope, the love, the adoration coming to the Lord of heaven and earth who favors us? 
I'm just telling you, if you're here this morning, you've been favored. I mean, if you were able to get in your car, come here to this place to worship the Lord God, you've been favored. Do you recognize that? I mean, you all were in Sunday school this morning, most of you, and you probably took prayer requests in your Sunday school class, and somebody mentioned somebody who's really sick or someone who's fighting a diagnosis or someone who's in the hospital or someone who's at death's door, and when you begin to realize, hey, I'm not that person, that means I've been favored. It's not that God doesn't love them, but I mean, my goodness, it's the wonder of God's love for me. It could be me at death's door. It could be me in a hospital bed. It could be me going through long-term cancer treatment. It could be me with a diagnosis that the doctor can't cure. It could be me who suffers overwhelmingly. But God's been kind to me. It ought to cause love for Him, church. I mean, when you realize the favor that God's poured out on your life and my life, the fact that we gather in this place without fear of retribution and are able to worship freely what a wonder what a grace what a kindness of our god it all inspire praise i'm just telling you when mary had that encounter with the angel of the lord she was overcome yes with concern about her livelihood yes with what people might think but i'm telling you the the main thing mary was overcome with was praise and adoration to the god who favored her life and so she started singing in the backwoods of Judah a song of deliverance. I was reading a commentary on it this week, and, and one of the writers, he said something like this. He said, in Mary's song, she has declared the warfare that Almighty God is waging, not because he owes his people anything, but because he loves his people with an everlasting love. Boy, what a way to look at Mary's song. This is a song of triumph. It's a song of deliverance. It's a song of war. It's a declaration that God is on the move in the life of His people and He will not be stopped. And right there, in the middle of Mary's song, is a declaration from her heart to yours. My God is merciful. She, she says in Luke chapter 1 in verse 50, And His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. Six times in Luke's gospel that word mercy is used. And five of those occurrences happen in Luke chapter 1 between Mary's song and Zechariah's song. They're, they're centered, they're concentrated here. It tells us something about the nature of Jesus' act in coming into the earth, doesn't it? It tells us about the fact that Jesus is the embodiment, the personification of the mercy of God toward His people. The fact that Christ has invaded the world and turned it upside down is a proof that God's mercy has been poured out to His people. I just want you to see simply this morning two realities about the mercy of Almighty God. And then I want us to spend a few moments at the end this morning talking about how do we activate the mercy of God in our lives. How do we activate the mercy of God in our lives? So see first this morning in Luke chapter 1 in verse 50, the source of God's mercy toward His people. The source of His mercy toward His people. It says in Luke chapter 1, and His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. Now Mary says it, it is God's mercy. It's not, it's not a, a, an idol's mercy. It's not the people's mercy. It's not the government's mercy. It's God's mercy that is for those who fear Him. See, the source is in God Himself. So I want you to understand this morning that the mercy of God that He's poured out for you and the mercy of God that's poured out for me and the mercy of God that was poured out at the cross for the whole world is a mercy that is inherent. It's a part of, it's built up in to the person of God Himself. You say, Pastor, how do we know that? Well, we know that because of the testimony of God's Word. But let me just guide you back for a moment to Exodus 
chapter 34. I love this text. In fact, Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, it is sort of a theme that runs through the whole of the Old Testament that reveals a part of the character of God. So if you say, how do I know the character of God? This is a great couple of verses to memorize. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. Because in these verses, God reveals to his people his nature. So I want you to read. I'm going to begin reading in verse 5. It says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, that's Moses there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. See, the Lord reveals about himself that a part of who he is, I mean, inherent to his nature, is to be merciful. Now, you and I know not everybody has that gift, right? I mean, you know it. If you've ever had to care for someone who's sick, you found out real quick whether or not you had the gift for mercy. Some of us do. Bless goodness for the mercy that some of us have. We're able to endure in our tender care over our loved ones. We're able to meet all of the needs. And when they ring that bell or they text us or they call us on the phone from the other room and say, I need 14 more Dr. Peppers because I've run out of the first case that you've already given me. And and when they say, I need that chicken soup, not, not not real hot, not real cold. I mean, make it like Goldilocks, just right. I mean, when we're, when we're annoying in our illness and God gives us a family member who just loves us anyways, boy, that's mercy, isn't it? It's, amen. We got, we got amens all over the room this morning. And then some of us realize pretty quickly, don't we, that we, we can care for those we love, but we're really not good at it. We don't have that mercy in us. Some of you, you, you kind of have the quality like my old t-ball coach. Now, I, I played one season of t-ball. That is the most athletics I have ever done in my entire life. I know y'all aren't shocked. Um, but Coach Baxley in, in uh, K-5 t-ball, God bless that man because his, he, he and his wife were so kind to us and and, and, and she was our catcher most of the time. And I never, I've told you this before, I never understood the concept of dropping the bat. Uh, I always slung the bat. And, and I, I mean, her knees were black and blue the whole season because I'd just sling that black bat behind me and it just beat her to death. But Coach Baxley used to look at us, five-year-old T-ball kids, and he'd say, shake it off. It'll be all right. You bleeding from every orifice, shake it off, it'll be all right. You got a broke arm, shake it off, it'll be all right. I mean, that was, that was not mercy, that, that was tough love. Shake it off, it'll be all right. Some of us, we have that attitude, don't we? We've got that personality, shake it off, it'll be all right. Aren't you grateful that a part of the character of holy God is to be merciful toward his children? I mean, just built into the DNA of Almighty God is that he's merciful. In fact, God is so merciful that Jeremiah tells us in Lamentations chapter 3 that his mercy is new every morning. It means he never runs out. Some of you, you you late risers, you there, you know, noon is a good time to get up, right? But some of you, I know, y'all are early people, early birds. Y'all tell me, you know, you're up 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. You're up early. You see the sunrise. I like to see the sunset. Some of you are all about that sunrise. I have to see the sunrise pretty often, but I'd much rather watch the sunset. Uh, but some of you are all about that sunrise. And, and so I just want to invite you to think about this this morning. You probably already thought about it. When you look at that sunrise early in the morning, just a reminder that God's grace and his mercy is new to you that day. All the, all the mercy you used up the day before, that's okay. He's got more for you. He never runs out because his character is infinite. 
He's unlimited. He's not bound by the resources of time and space like you and I are. I mean, in and of himself, he's got everything you'll ever need. And all the mercy you could ever need, God already has for you. You know, my friend, that's the reason that when one of those malefactors who hung on the side of Jesus on that dark day, when he looked toward the man on the middle cross and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's the reason that Jesus could without a doubt say, today you'll be with me in paradise because his mercy was sufficient at the cross. It's the reason when old blind Bartimaeus was sitting on the side of the Jericho road and he heard a crowd passing by said, hey, who's that? What's, who's the guy in the crowd? They said, that's Jesus. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus had mercy on blind Bartimaeus. I mean, it's the reason when you're down in the pit of your despair, when all hope is lost, when song has given way to sighing, when the doctor has made a diagnosis, when the banker says you can't pay the bill when you're broken in your home facing the divorce lawyer when you're absolutely undone with caring for your parent who has dementia or Alzheimer's I mean it means at the end of the day when you don't know how to go on God's mercy is sufficient because its source is in him Mary's out there in the hills of Judah singing a song oh it's not a little lullaby it's a song of war and this little maiden girl in the hills of judah is catching the attention because she's singing about her god who is merciful i want you to think about this for a moment who heard mary's song I mean, she's out in the middle of nowhere. Maybe Elizabeth and John, maybe they, they're hearing this song. And, or Elizabeth and Zechariah, they're hearing this song. And, and maybe they grab some scroll and they write down a few words. But I mean, nobody had a tape recorder. Nobody had a Walkman. Uh, no, no, nobody had a, a cell phone, get it out and record video, put it on TikTok, make it go live. I mean... In 2021, she'd have gone live, man. I mean, we'd make this thing viral. Let me, let me tell everybody about it. But I just want you to think about this. She hit it on her heart. This song that Mary's singing when she's declaring the nature of our God, it comes from the power of the Spirit, and it's written on her heart. And I think all those years later when Luke came to do his investigation and to do his research about what God had been doing in the person of Jesus Christ, I think Mary said, let me sing you a song that I sang once upon a time, a song that God gave me, a song that tells of his glory, a song that reveals that he's merciful. So you see first the source of God's mercy, and it's him. It's his own person. His mercy comes from his nature, his character, his person. But then I want you to see the scope of his mercy. Well, look at Luke 1. Mary says, in his mercy, it's for who? Well, she says it's for who? She says it's for those who fear him from generation to generation. Mary says that the scope of God's mercy, that is, that the people who can receive God's mercy, it's for all those who fear him from generation to generation. So that tells us some things about the mercy of God. Number one, it tells us this, that there's nobody, there's nobody, listen church, there's nobody beyond the reach of the mercy of holy God. I know sometimes we think that. I know sometimes we, uh, we've talked to that neighbor a thousand times, invited him to church. Can, can, pause a sermon, let me tell you something. I love that you invite people to church. I want you to invite people to church. I want you to make sure people are welcome. I want everybody to come. We want to fill this place up. Can I just tell you this? Way more important than people being invited to church is, being, is people being invited to follow Jesus. 
Way more important. I mean, like, like infinitely more important than people coming to church is people being invited to follow Jesus. So be careful. Don't let the conversation end by asking if they go to church. Make sure you ask them, do they know Jesus as their Savior and Lord? And if they don't, invite them to come to know him. You say, I don't know exactly how to do it. Well, just tell your story. Just tell them what you know about Jesus, what he's done for you. But Mary says something about the scope of God's mercy. She says, it's for those who fear him. And that means that it's for everybody. There's nobody beyond the reach of God's mercy. And sometimes you, you've got the grandson, the granddaughter, the, the cousin, the, the aunt, the uncle, they can be hard-hearted toward the Lord. They, 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 you've had the conversation. They've said, listen, I, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm tired of it. I don't believe it. I don't want anything to do with it. And you think, man, they're, they're just too hard-hearted. They're beyond. I'm telling you, they're not beyond his reach. His arm is not too short that he can't save. His mercy endures forever. His love for his people is new every morning. His faithfulness is great. There is no one beyond the reach of the mercy of holy God. I'm telling you, when you and I get convicted about that, that there's nobody beyond the reach of the mercy of holy God, then it should motivate us to pray. As we prepared for Revival, we, we identified 92 people who were lost and were praying for them. I hope you haven't given up on that. I hope the people you identified in your life that are lost, who don't know Christ, I hope you're still praying. I hope you recognize that until we draw our final breath, we, we've got an opportunity to pray for the people in our lives who don't know Christ. And the reason we can pray with confidence and the reason we can pray with assurance and the reason that we can pray faithfully and the reason that we can pray uh, for God to work is because we know that God is merciful and we know that God's mercy is not just for us. It's not just for our four and no more. God's mercy is for everybody who fears Him. You, you can amen that. But the real question is, will you live that? I mean, it's good to say in Sunday morning in church and preachers all hot and bothered and worked up about the sermon and, oh, God's mercy is for everybody. Amen, preacher, have mercy is for everybody. But I mean, do you live it? Do you give it away? Y'all know everybody's looking for help right now, right? I mean, everywhere you go, the signs are just unreal, the amount of help. People are looking for. And one of the things that I bet you've noticed, that we've noticed for sure, is that that means that, that things are moving a lot slower than normal in the grocery store, in the restaurant, in the bank, in the post office. I mean, in all the places where you normally go to do your business, things are just moving slower. It also means that details are being missed, right? Right? Uh, it means that, that the people who are working, a lot of times they've not been there for very long. They've not gotten the training that they need. They just signed up to work and somebody put them to work and they're doing the best they can with what they've got. And they, you know. You know, one of the ways that you and I show the mercy of God is by just letting some things go. We're, we went to dinner last night and it was kind of a shambles. I mean, it wasn't anything like what it was supposed to be, and service wasn't like it normally is, and the food didn't come out like it like it ought to. And anyways, we didn't say much. It's all good. It doesn't really matter that much. And we're going to check out and uh, pay the bill. And cashier said, "Hey, how was how was your food? How was your service?" And and I said, "It was fine." And we paid the bill, tipped our server, walked out. And I told Mary, "I said, what 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 good does it do? They know." They're overwhelmed already. Just let it go, right? I'm telling that to me, right? I'm saying it to her, but I'm telling it to me. Just let it go. I'm just telling you, what, what would happen, church, if the people of God called Friendship Baptist Church decided, you know what, the mercy of God is for everybody. And one of the ways that we're going to show that this Christmas season is by not getting all worked up over things that have no eternal significance. Instead, we're going to tip the server extra. 
We're, we're going to demonstrate the smile to the, to the worker in the post office. Uh, we're going to make sure that, that, that the guy at Publix that offers to take our groceries out, and that we don't overwhelm him because he's already got to take groceries out for 15 million other people. I mean, we're just going to go the extra mile. And then when we do it, we're going to, and they, and they, because they'll do this to you, right? They, they'll look at you and say, are you sure? Right? They'll say that to you. Are you sure? And, you, and then that's your opportunity. That's when you just say, absolutely. Jesus showed mercy to me. I just want to show grace to you. Be blessed in his name. There's a little witness. Can you imagine what would happen if the people of God called Friendship Baptist Church just decided all of a sudden we're going to take the mercy of God for all people seriously and stop getting hot and bothered over things that don't matter and start showing the love of God, the mercy of God, the covenant faithfulness of God to people who need God in their lives. And it changed the world. See, the mercy of God is for all people. Mary said, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And that means this, that the same mercy that was needed by your grandparents and my grandparents, by, by, by your grandchildren, and, and one day my grandchildren, we're not there yet, but I mean one day, uh, the same mercy that, that they need is the same mercy we need. We're all dependent upon the same thing. See, there's not a new gospel. Oh, we got a new generation. We got a new generation of people who are lost and undone in their sin in ways that you and I, we struggle to imagine, to understand. Uh, we've got a new generation of people who, who are walking away from the Lord, who have no understanding of the claims of Christ upon their lives, who have no, no desire to relate to God in any way. I mean, that's just a part of the world in which we live. But I'm just telling you, the, the thing that the people of our generation need is the same thing that our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation, and our great-grandparents' generation needed. It's the mercy of God demonstrated in Christ. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. It means there's no other way. There's no other path to redemption. There is no other way that leads to life. It's all dependent. We're all dependent upon the mercy of God in Christ. But I want you to see this morning what Mary says. See, she says, and his mercy, that means the scope of his, uh, the source of his mercy is God himself. His mercy is for those who fear him. That, that means it's for all people. His mercy is for everybody. His scope is to everyone. But I want you to notice that phrase there that Mary says. His mercy is for those who fear him. See, we, we could come together this morning and have a real nice short sermon and talk about the mercy of God, that his mercy is sourced in him, and its scope is for everyone, and, and give the invitation right here. Receive God's mercy. And I think we'd all walk away and go, still not exactly sure what it means to fear the Lord. I mean, if that's the thing that activates the mercy of God in our life, if it's our fear of God, if it's our, if it's our reverencing of Him, if it's our awe of Him, if it's, if it's that holy adoration that activates the mercy of God in our life, then maybe we need to spend just a moment this morning talking about how do we fear the Lord? I mean, in practice, how do we do that? So I want you this morning to just think for a moment with me about, first of all, some, some things that the fear of the Lord means. And then I want you to see three ways that we can activate the mercy of, our, of God in our lives by fearing the Lord. So let's just consider for a moment what, what we know about the fear of the Lord. What, what does that mean in our lives as the people of God? Well, number one, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. As Psalm, or Job says in Job 28 and verse 28, that the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And in Psalm 19 and verse 9, we learn that the fear of the Lord is clean and it endures forever. Uh, and that word clean there in Psalm 19, it's talking about purity and, and, and being without any sort of imperfection. It's the idea of, of gold that is refined beyond uh, dealing with any impurity. It's perfect. It's altogether right. It's exactly what you want. It's of the highest reward. And that's what the psalmist says. The fear of the Lord is like it's that thing that's priceless in our lives. 
In Proverbs 1, in verse 7, we learn that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In, in Proverbs 8, in verse 13, we learn that the fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. Part of what it means to fear the Lord is to agree with God about the things that He says, both, both those things that are righteous and those things that are sinful and evil. It means we agree with Him. We say, God, you say that's sinful, I say it's sinful. God, you say that's holy, I say it's holy. I agree with you because all of your judgments are right. In Proverbs 10 and verse 27, we learn that the fear of the Lord prolongs life. Does that mean, preacher, that every person who fears the Lord has a long life? No. Remember, brothers and sisters, that the, the Proverbs are just principles. They're, they're, they're axioms on the normal way of life. This is what normally happens. And so one of the things that the, that the writer there is saying is, listen, if you, if you live in a fear of the Lord, if you do the things that God commands you to do, it will tend it will tend to bring a longer life. It will tend to lead to human flourishing. In Proverbs 14 and verse 27, similarly, we learn that the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. In Proverbs 15 and verse 33, the fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom. In Proverbs 16 and verse 6, the fear of the Lord is a pathway away from evil. In Proverbs 19 and verse 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life. Say, is this just an Old Testament thing? No, no. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 31, we learn that the fear of the Lord leads to the multiplication of the church. I said that right. Go, see, go search it out for me. But Acts chapter 9 verse 31, when you look at what caused the church to multiply, one of the qualities of the church that multiplied, that grew, is that they feared the Lord. I'm just telling you. We can be good people and not grow. We can be giving people and not grow. We can be kind people and not grow. But oh, if we fear the Lord, there's a growth that comes from that. I mean, when we as, I don't mean you individually. Some of you say sometimes, preacher, you get all worked out. I'm doing these things. Yeah, I know you are, but what about all of us? What about the whole body? The whole people of God called Friendship Baptist Church, where, where are we collectively doing the things that God has called us to do? I'm just telling you, if we collectively fear the Lord, if that'd be a part of our life as the whole people of God, it would lead to the growth of the church, the flourishing of God's people, the multiplication of disciples in this place. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, we see that the fear of the Lord motivates evangelism. There Paul talks about the fact that because we fear the Lord, so we proclaim His Word. There's a call on our life to make disciples, to proclaim the gospel, to share the story of Jesus. Maybe one of the reasons that we don't do it as faithfully as we should, or maybe even at all, is because we don't have a right fear of the Lord. So I want us just for a moment this morning as we come to the end of this to note three ways that we can fear the Lord and so activate His mercy in our lives. You see, Mary says, and His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. So let's answer the question, how do we fear the Lord, I want you to see three ways. And we're going to use the acronym ACT. Because fearing the Lord is an action. It's, it's something that we do. It's not something that we are. It's not something we consider. It's something we do. And so I want to use the word ACT. And I want you to see just three simple ways that we can, we can fear the Lord and so activate God's mercy in our lives. Number one is this. We accept the Lord's conviction and correction concerning our sin. One of the ways that you fear the Lord actively in your life is to accept the Lord's conviction and correction concerning your sin. You see, brothers and sisters, the reality is that we're all sinful people. I mean, we're actively sinful people. 
Maybe not right here, maybe not right in this moment, maybe maybe not even on Sunday. I mean, maybe you could go all of Sunday, but I'm just telling you, even those of us who've walked with Jesus a long time, those of us who've experienced the sanctifying power of His Spirit, those who can say we're more like Jesus today than we were a year ago, a decade ago, three decades ago, I mean, even those of us who walk with Him closely, we're still sinful people. If you're eight or 98, you're still sinful. There's never a point in this life, on this side of eternity, where we get to the place and say, I have arrived. I'm okay. God doesn't have to do anything else with me. It's all done. See, we're always prone to wander. In fact, that's the reason that the old song says he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun, the earth, Jupiter, Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. Because God's still working on you, because you're still a sinner, because I'm still a sinner, I, I think the way that we begin to fear the Lord in our life is to accept his conviction and his correction concerning our sin. So how does God do that? Well, number one, he does that in his word, doesn't he? I, I mean, if you're here today, you've put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're his by faith then you have the power of the Spirit at work in your life. So that means when you open this book, it's not just words on a page. It's the living Word of God. It comes to life. The more that you read it, the more that you'll understand it. If you don't understand it and you'll ask for wisdom, He'll give you wisdom and understanding. And this Word will come to life to you and it will begin to feed you and nourish you and strengthen you and correct you and convict you. And all of a sudden where you say, I didn't exactly know that I had any sin in my life. I thought I was a pretty good person. God, by the power of His Spirit and the truth of His Word, will begin to shine the light on the darkness in your life and in mine. Maybe I've told you before, but it's a good story, and I feel like telling it, so I'll tell it again. Papa Gandhi lived on 15th Avenue there in Pensacola the last years of his life. He rented a duplex apartment from the Methodist Church. He'd been a Methodist pastor in and they got a system where they have apartment homes, retirement homes, different things for pastors to be able to use and rent. And so he rented this little duplex apartment, had two bedrooms and two bathrooms and a little living area and a little kitchen. And in the back of the house, there was a detached garage. And on the side of this detached garage, there was a lean-to where all sorts of, of yard implements had been stored over the years. And that little lean-to was rotted and falling down and it was going to hurt somebody. And so uh, one summer, Papa Gandhi put in with my dad and my brother and he said, listen, we've got to tear that thing down. It's going to hurt somebody. Let's, let's just tear it down and get it, get it out of the way. We talked to the church. They were okay with it. We're going to do it. And so uh, Russell and Daddy, I, I was too young. I guess I was probably you know, just knocking around age and, and just watching all this go on. But Russell and Daddy went over and and they're there, and they're they're getting this lean-to torn off of this old garage, and 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 it had been moldy and dank and dark and and wet back in there. So you know what happened? I mean, when they tore the roof off that thing and the sides came falling down, uh, about five million cockroaches went everywhere because they hide in the darkness. And I'm just telling you what you and I need in our lives is for the spirit of the Holy One to come and pull down the shed that we've covered our sin over with so that the glorious light of Christ and the truth of the gospel would shine on us. Not so that we could be condemned. You understand that. That's not the point. The point's not to condemn anybody. The point's so we can accept the conviction and the correction of the Holy One. Number two, how do you fear the Lord? Well, one, you've got to accept the conviction and correction of the Lord concerning your sin. But number two, how do you fear the Lord in your life, in my life? We've got to commit to obey the commands of the Lord in our everyday lives. 
That's the second way you fear it. it. One, accept his conviction and his correction about your sin. But number two, commit yourself to obey his commands in everyday life. I've told you before that information without transformation leads to condemnation. I believe that with all my heart. I think one of the gravest dangers we have in the church, not just friendship, but, but, but evangelical churches in the United States, maybe even around the world, one of the gravest dangers we have is that we have a whole lot of people who are like sponges. We're soaking up all sorts of information about Jesus. We want all the facts. Uh, we want all the information. We want all the particulars. We want all of the details. We want all of the questions answered. I mean, we want as much information as we can possibly get about Jesus. And then we resolve to do absolutely nothing with it. I'm just here to tell you this morning, if you've come to Bible study on Sunday morning, if you've come to worship on Sunday morning, if you come back for church tonight, if your motivating factor in any and all of this is just to gain in your knowledge about Jesus, you, you, you can go to a university, you can go to a seminary, you can go to, to, to your local library and you can get books that will increase your knowledge about Jesus, but they won't do one thing for your heart. It's not about information. It's about transformation. So the question for us who say we want to fear the Lord, we want to activate his mercy in our lives by fearing him, the question for us is will we do what he says? We're to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We know that. But I mean, do we practice it? When, when we hear the Sunday school lesson about letting the peace of God rule in your hearts and then we walk out on Monday morning and, and we get worked up and we act like a jerk and we cuss somebody out because they cut us off in traffic or they've done us wrong in business. I mean, is that really letting the peace of God rule in our hearts? When we come sit in, in Sunday morning in church and we, we hear the preacher talk about the fact that we're supposed to go and reach all sorts of people, be welcoming like Jesus was welcoming, everybody's welcome, and, and then we go and we encounter someone who doesn't meet our, our understanding of, of what a good church member would be and we just pass them by because we don't want to take the time. I mean, is that really putting God's word into practice? I mean, we're all guilty. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of hearing the word and ignoring the word. I'm just telling you, if we want to be a people who fear the Lord, then at some point we've got to decide that in our hearts, in our lives, on an everyday basis, not, not just on Sunday and not just on Wednesday, but every day, we're going to do what God tells us to do. We're going to obey the commands of the Lord. And I'll just tell you this. Remember the words of Jesus who taught us that his commands are not burdensome. That, that to be yoked to him is to learn a new way of living. It's to be unburdened from the world so, so that we can know the real work of the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you why some of us thrash against God why some of us are burned by him and bitter towards him. You want to know why? It's because we're trying to do what God's called us to do while we also do what we want to do in the power of the flesh. You, you can't do the work that Jesus calls you to do. You can't be yoked to him if you aren't unyoked from the world. You can't take on his work if you don't unburden yourself from the world. I'm telling you, if you try to serve two masters, it will make you bitter. It will make you sour. It will make you burdened. And one day it will make you lost for eternity. One of the ways that we fear the Lord is just to commit ourselves right here today. God, I may not have done it before, but from here on out, I want to do the best that I can for as long as I can to obey the commands of the Lord. And that means I'm willing in Sunday school, in church, but on a daily basis as I open the book to listen to the word of the Lord so that I can do what you say. You want to activate the mercy of God in your life, you've got to fear the Lord. That's what Mary says. She says his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. How do you do that? How do you fear the Lord? Well, one, you've, you've got to accept his conviction and correction about your sin. N number two, you, you've got to be willing to commit yourself to obey his commands in your everyday life. 
Number three, you have to trust that His promises are true. Both to save and to condemn. A part of fearing the Lord is trusting that His promises are true. Both to save and to condemn. See, I think one of the things that we all struggle with is, is what do we do when life gets overwhelmingly hard? I mean, we're, we're pretty okay with following God when everything's going right. I mean, most of us. As long as life's okay, as long as it's not overwhelmingly hard, we're, we're okay. But you and I both know, and you, you've lived long enough, I think, at this point, most of you, all of us, we've lived long enough at this point to know that life's not always exceedingly good. Life's not always easy. You can do everything right in life and it still be an absolute disaster sometimes. You, you can take all the precautions about your health and still wind up with a diagnosis that, that leaves you miserable in pain. You can, all the, you can do all you can do to protect your finances and self, set yourself up for security and retirement and, and one thing can happen that you had no control of and all of a sudden you're a pauper. You, you can do all that you can do to nurture your children so that they love and follow Jesus as their own Savior and Lord, and they still rebel against Him. I'm just telling you, you can do everything you can do to follow the Lord, and life won't always turn out exceedingly good. In fact, sometimes it turns out exceedingly bad. And it's at that moment when the burdens and the sorrows and the difficulties and the disasters and the trials and the deaths of life won't stop, that most of us start to wonder, where are you? Where's the blessing? Where's the favor? Where's the grace? Where's the mercy? And if we're not careful, we'll walk down the road of what ifs and wherefores so long that eventually we just stop believing altogether. When in reality, a part of fearing the Lord so that His mercy is demonstrated to us is that we trust that His promises are true. To save and to condemn to rescue and to destroy, to forgive and to pour out wrath. And if we, in the midst of our sorrows and our sufferings, where nobody else sees the horrors of our heart except God alone, are able to say, Lord, I don't understand you but I trust you. Oh, then my friend, we're at the point where mercy is poured out. Mary was in the backwoods of Judah, overcome by the favor of God poured out in her life. And she started singing the song about who her God is. Her God and our God. My God and your God. And she said, my God is merciful. I'm just here to tell you this morning, my life isn't perfect, but I've experienced mercy at every turn. And I've got a reason to praise Him today. How about you? Have you experienced the mercy of God in your life? Do you know what it means to fear the Lord? 
so that you might activate His mercy in your life. If you do, you've got a reason to praise Him too. And if you're here this morning, you say, I, I don't know about His mercy. I've never followed Him in faith. I've never feared Him as my own Lord. My friend, you could start today. I mean, just right here in this place. There where you sit in a moment when we sing, you could step forward. Say, I've never known His mercy before, but I know it's for me. I know it's for today. I know it's for those who fear Him. I want to fear Him as my own this day.